Thank you, Ed. It's nice to have your brother-in-law introducing you, isn't it? He only knows my good points, which is good. So I'm safe. I just want to recognize all of you here as people of good judgment. That's a very important consideration. Most people don't understand that our lifestyle largely determines our level of health, our longevity, and everything else. But you are people in the know, and I want to congratulate you for being here. I also want to recognize uh, uh, Kathy. I mean, Kathy is an incredible woman. I mean, I got to know her over the phone, uh, in discussions, and so on, and uh, I, I think what she has done here in this town in the last seven years, the best place to live, I found out, right? <laughs> what she has done with her team of volunteers is the finest I have seen in my travels anywhere in the world in terms of community medicine. This, this is community medicine at its very best. Bringing the community together, doing something together, feeling support, swimming upstream against the culture that says, don't worry about it, eat, drink, and be merry, the doctors will take care of you tomorrow. Not true. When it comes to these chronic diseases, you are the chairman of the board of health. You can do more for yourself than any physician can, any hospital can, when it comes to these chronic diseases. You know what I'm talking about? Heart disease. I mean, a bypass doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't cure you. It just buys you time so that you can make the right decisions, learning them right here. This is a community medicine center. This is an educational center. This is the finest I have seen. When it comes to high blood pressure, medication doesn't really cure your high blood pressure. Just forget your pills for a couple of days and you know what happens, right? When it comes to diabetes, insulin doesn't cure diabetes. As a matter of fact, when you pass on Sunday, you still will be taking insulin and more than ever before because it's just buys time. So this is a very special place where you, have, where you witness what one woman can do that is determined to make a difference. We ought to stand up and give her a standing ovation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know why I'm here, <laughs> because when I saw all the icons in the movement that we call the lifestyle medicine movement, I'm just a little guy, I'm just a regular guy. I don't know why, you, why she called me to come here when you have all these aces up there on the screen. Well, actually, I will be introducing and uh, interviewing Dr. McDougall on Tuesday night at the National Convention in Orlando. He's the recipient of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. He has done more in saving lives than anyone that I know of. And so I feel very privileged to try to give people an idea of who he really is by asking some inappropriate questions. So let me show you the first uh, slide here. What's the lesson? What's the lesson? Be healthy. What's the lesson? What? Oh, what's the lesson? Live right. What's the lesson? I tell you, the lesson is don't be a Canadian. <laughs> Except we are all in that situation, aren't we? 
So we are making the choices now of what's going to happen. We are shaping our own future. It's an awesome thought. It's a great privilege. It's an awesome responsibility. So today I want to talk to you about how to eat more and weigh less. Uh, usually I take two hours, but uh, Kathy reminded me, she said, we have to be out here at 1.30. So all I can do is give you a slim view of a big subject. What to do about overweight? What to do about excess weight? What do you see there? You see three chairs? What do you see? They represent three time era eras. You see the 1900, the 1930, and the 1970. What happened to the chairs? They pretty much stayed the same. Until. What in the world happened? I mean, it's an amazing thing. I, uh, I just flew in a few days ago from uh, Southern California to Orlando, Southwest, and uh, the plane was full except for one seat, and that was the seat right next to me, and I felt pretty good about this. So I felt I can do some studies, I can have some of my books out there. I, I was feeling pretty good. And then, before the plane took off, they opened the door one more time. <laughs> and a very burly man walks in down the center aisle, there's only one seat left. I had to make some attitudinal adjustments. <laughs> I love large people, no problem. But I had to make some change because my expectations had now shifted. And so, as a matter of fact, I'm such a nice guy. I even lifted up the armrest. And the man and then man began to wedge himself into the seat, and under his breath he said, isn't it terrible, they're making these seats smaller every year. <laughs> and I never said a word. <laughs> so, we have to recognize that obesity is a huge issue. Obesity sets the stage for many of our chronic diseases. When you look at it, you see that diabetes, the likelihood of developing diabetes for an obese person is increased by 700%. You see much more blood pressure problems, more heart disease, arthritis is four times more common, asthma is more common, sleep apnea is very common among obese people, and then you also have to worry about breast cancer, prostate cancer, and you have to worry about colon and cervical cancer. It's all there. And besides, Finding its way to promote these diseases, it also shortens your lifespan. For every extra pound above your ideal weight, you will give up one month of life. So if you're 60 pounds overweight, that's 60 months, that's five years. So it's not only that you're encouraging chronic disease and you impair the quality of your life, but also you shave off years of your life. You are in charge. It really takes issue with the old idea that we used to have. Well, he, he up there pulls the plug someday, there's nothing I can do. R wrong! Oh, no, no, I have the wrong genes, I picked the wrong parents. Wrong! Because now we have what we call epigenetics, which teaches us that you can actually suppress the genes that are kind of uh, pushing certain diseases upon you, you can actually suppress the expression of these, these genes and they never have to bother you. You are the CEO of health. And that's what this program is all about. And I really want to congratulate the people here and also putting you up in such an elegant, traditional, historic place, the Ritz. I said to my wife, I'm speaking at the Ritz. I said, wow. <laughs> now, this is what has happened here. <clears throat> you see, the weight is up quite a bit <clears throat> in our society. We used to be about 
50% of the population was overweight and obese. Now it's 75%. Three out of four adults are overweight or obese. It all happened largely during the last 40 years. What happened in the last 40 years? Who is responsible for this change? <laughs> oh, we don't want to name any names here. You mean fast food industry, right? Oh yeah, we did change, didn't we? The 1970s saw the change as we changed from slow food to fast food. We changed from eating at home to eating out. We changed from eating potatoes to moving towards Pringles. We used to eat corn, now we're eating Doritos. Do you, do you, are you with me? We used to drink water, now we drink soda pop. We used to have beans, now we eat burgers. Do you see the change that took place? Big, monumental change in our culture. 1970s. And with it, you have more concentrated calories. And some other things happen. Who is responsible? So your point is fast food. What else happened? What else, what else is giving us this obesity? Processed food, yes. So we shifted from foods to industrialized products. Right? Very good. Anybody else? Exercise. Oh, yeah, we kind of lost. Aren't we exercising? You are. Yeah, of course. I mean, I saw you all getting warmed up. Here. I saw the steam rising here. <laughs> so exercise is being sort of phased out. You know, we have these labor-saving devices. We call them LSD. <laughs> labor-saving devices. At the hospital, it's always difficult to find uh, the stairs. You always find the elevators. In the hotel, the same thing, isn't it? So exercise. So we have three things now. You mentioned fast food, processed foods, uh, exercise less. What else? Well, sedentary lifestyle, that goes along very well with the exercise uh, uh, decline. Yes, what else? Stress. We talked about this is refined foods. Now, give me some other ideas. Stress. Stress. Oh, I see. Oh, does stress cause you to gain weight? How does that work? Oh, you eat differently when you are stressed. Is that right? Yeah. I remember this lady coming to our program. One night she told me, she said, This Laos of a husband, my husband's a dentist, and he is in Hawaii, and I'm in Michigan, and it's winter time. Why did he take me along? What? Did you ask him? No. She was upset. She was really angry. And she told me, she said, it was 11 o'clock at night. I'm in front of my mirror. I'm disrobing. And for a second, I just look in the mirror and I see myself naked truth. And it was so shocking. I let it all hang out. <laughs> and my anger came to a boiling level. Why did he do this to me? I mean, I had a plan to lose weight, three pounds, while he was gone for 10 days. And look, now what I'm going to do? What do you think she did? She turned the light off. And then she went downstairs where the kitchen is, where the refrigerator is. She found Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And she put on all the things that she could find with a maraschino cherry on top. She said, I deserve this because this man abandoned me. And she went to bed happy. Stress. Stress relief. Eat. Right? Good point. Until the next morning. And then she felt angry at herself. I broke my code of honor. I was going to surprise him. Ah! What do you think she did next? Yeah, there you go. Food. What about thyroid problems? Can thyroid problems cause obesity? Big time. I mean, you can have people that do everything right. They follow Kathy to the T here, and they're gaining weight. Why? Because they didn't check out with the physician to have the thyroid test done. Because if you have an underfunctioning thyroid, the calories don't turn over fast enough. It's like a thermostat. 
And so, but of course, thyroid problems are only two out of 100 people that are obese. So we talked about thyroid, right? Yeah. And we said, yeah, people that say, yeah, it's the glands that the problem. Could it be the salivary gland? <laughs> or what about upbringing? You've raised your kids in a certain way. As a matter of fact, you didn't breastfeed your children. And you pushed that bottle in because after all, you are a very modern woman. And you don't want to have Cooper's droopage. No breastfeeding for my kids. And with that, you have a tendency to overfeed those babies. Folks, you have to think about this. Breast milk changes its nutritional composition regularly every two, three, four, five weeks to meet the need of the evolving, growing baby. It's an absolute miracle that you can never duplicate even with the finest baby formula. Breastfeed. As long as you can until those teeth get too sharp. <laughs> so, what do you see here? Yes, there was a question there. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. So, I have more children. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so why do people eat? Why do people eat? Number one, hunger. Number two, it's the time to eat, right? Rhythm, right? What else? Oh, depression, emotions. What are some of the emotions that drive us to eat? Celebrating number one place in Florida. Let's celebrate with celery sticks and um, carrot sticks, right? We don't do that. That's not culturally in. So celebration kind of has a tendency to push uh, extra calories in. What else? Your favorite team lost, so you're depressed. Ah, let's eat. How about being angry? How about having discord at home or at work? Food is a wonderful pacifier, but it's a kicker. It always kicks you in the butt. Okay. But you see, it's a very complex issue when you talk about overweight and obesity. There are no simple answers. So I just can give you a few ideas here. But the most important thing for any person that's interested in helping someone else is to be a kind, loving person. Husbands, you heard me, right? You don't have to tell her that she has these love handles. She already knows that. Be careful. Be wise. You make the change for yourself and inspire by modeling for the people in your environment. Yeah. Well, we already talked about the center lifestyle. Look at this. This is what we do, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's getting better. Look at this. phasing out muscle power. But please note, the real big issue is that our calorie intake has gone up since 1970 by about 400 to 500 calories a day. That's what happened. So let's take a look, take a look at the dietary changes that have happened beginning in the 1970s in a very profound manner. We already talked about the idea that the fast food industry kicked in 1970. Um, many people don't realize that these processed foods are engineered in such a way that you cannot just eat one item. Did you know this? And many, t and many times people don't realize that many of these processed food giants are actually directly related and owned by Philip Morris. The tobacco industry. Now, do you think the tobacco industry knows something about 
how to habituate people, how to addict people? Do they have a track record? Do they have a social conscience? No. no. So guess what they did when they purchased some of these companies? The first thing they did, they, go, they went to the largest research lab in brain research. And they said, tell us, what do we need to do to hijack the brain chemistry, the pleasure center of the brain? And they did the research and they said, if you put enough salt in, you have that sweet spot that comes into play. When you put enough salt in, oh, it's working very well too. And make sure also that you have enough fat in the food. Fats, oil, grease. Really? Have you ever wondered why some people, why most people, well, almost all people have a hard time eating just one Pringle. <laughs> Ever tried to eat just one M&M? Have you tried to eat just one Oreo? Can you do it? I had a couple of priests uh, uh, a couple of days ago uh, in Naples talking to me, and he said, you, you should really recommend uh, spiritual resources. You should tell people, pray. When the temptation is before you, pray. I said, I don't believe in that. Actually, I do, but I want to get his attention, these two priests. I wanted them to remember it. I said, I don't believe in that. You don't? You should come to the confessional. I said, no, it's all right. It's all right. I said, I believe in helping people to pray when they go to the supermarket where you have 60,000 foods screaming at you take me and I'll make you happy. And that's when you need to teach people to pray that they make the right choice of what they put into the cart because once it's in the cart, you take it home, you are a goner. True? Yes. Then prayer is too late. We have to be proactive. Are you with me there? Yeah. Because we are hooked. We are hooked. We're hooked. You know, when you give rats a choice to choose between sugar and cocaine, they will choose sugar. It's very powerful. We've underestimated the power of the excess amount of sugar, salt, and fat in these processed foods. I had a lady, last night she came to me and in, uh, in Fort Myers, and she said, Sir, I'm addicted to, to sugar. I cannot help it. I have a sweet tooth. She said, I mean, I, sl I slip out of bed in the middle of the night and make sure that my husband doesn't notice it to get my sugar fix. I said, really? I said, I have an answer. You need to come and see my son. My son is a dentist. He can pull that sweet tooth that you have. <laughs> but you know, it's a very simplistic answer to a very deep problem, isn't it? Because these foods actually hijack the brain chemistry and it happens within nanoseconds. The moment it's on your lips, it's within less than a second it hits the pleasure center of your brain. And you're helpless, helpless. So who is responsible for obesity? Well, but you see it's becoming very complex now, isn't it? You have to think of the food companies, you have to think about yourself, you have to figure out, uh, you know, these uh, 60,000 foods that are being uh, promoted for you to give you happiness. It's a cultural thing. The culture promotes obesity. And so, when I ask people who is responsible for obesity, I say, you are not. And nobody says, amen. I said, you don't believe me, do you? No, you're just setting a trap for me. I am responsible. I said, well, not totally. We have to take some responsibility. 
But we also have to understand that we're living in an obesogenic environment. That means it's promoting obesity. The culture pushes these kind of ideas. So let me just give you uh, some basic five guidelines. And if you follow these five guidelines uh, as best as you can, I can guarantee you that you will, on the average, lose one to two pounds if you have excessive weight. If you're underweight, come and see me, I'll talk to you, and I have an answer for that too, because that's an easy way to answer it. But let me first talk to you, the people that really are concerned about shaving off some pounds. Okay? So if you have more calories coming into the system than going out of the system, what happens to the extra calories? They're being collected, right? They go into a savings account, and they go to the fat bank. There's a central fat bank that usually collects these extra calories. And then after a while, as uh, the uh, deposits are being made and the withdrawals are lagging behind, that fat bank gets larger and larger, and it overflows, and you now have to establish branch offices all over your body. That's what happens. Then you look in the mirror sometime and you know that you have a family reunion coming up and you have your high school friends are going to meet with you and you cannot stand the idea that they're seeing you as you are and you now fall prey uh, to the merchants of misery that offering their wares at the power line as you leave the big store and you pay your money and there are all the magazines, how to lose seven pounds in seven days, how to lose 15 pounds in three weeks. And you fall, yeah, you're victimized now. I gotta get that weight off fast. Let me be very clear. If you really want to be successful in managing your weight, let all diets die. These diets are built on the principle of monotony. Grapefruits, 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 grapefruits. Grapes, 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 grapes. It's just one item. That's sort of the magic thing. Drink this special tea and take a bath and it will, the, the fat will just melt away. And you fall for it because you're so desperate. Folks, be clear-minded that all diets die. Somebody is taking you for a ride. It happens all too often, up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And in the end, you believe it. There's something wrong with me. My parents didn't put me on the pity on the pot at the right time. It's my parents. It's its environment. The way I grew up. Yes, uh, folks. We are adults, we have to take responsibility for our actions now. It's too late. We are adults. We are responsible. We can make better choices. You have a beautiful environment here that supports you so you don't feel so lonesome and so miserable doing it all by yourself. That's what we do in our CHIP program. It's called the Complete Health Improvement Program. We have some 86,000 people. These people have lost 500 tons of excess weight. We've published 50 plus scientific medical articles about the success of what you're doing here, that's what we do in the CHIP program, where we have 50, 100, 150 people, and then we have 19 videos, and then we have question and answer periods, and we discuss adult learning style, what can we do? 86,000 people. New people. Physicians are shocked when they have to reduce the insulin when they have to take people off the insulin after three to four months. They're shocked when they have to take the people off their blood pressure medication because the patients have their blood pressures going so low that it's difficult, it's dangerous to drive your car because you are blacking out because the power of diet is so powerful. Dr. McDougall talks about that. Food is medicine. medicine. 
People come to me and they say, I had arthritis, swollen joints. It was very difficult to even open a can. After three, four months, it's gone. The inflammation is down big time. Weight. It's easy to bring weight down. All you have to do is follow five guidelines. Are you ready? Do you want to write them out? Okay. If you don't want to write them out, it's okay. Because I gave you a little booklet. Didn't we give you a booklet here? U-turn, how to turn things around, how to re or reverse heart disease, how to reverse diabetes, how to eat more and lose weight. Okay, let's take a look. We have to understand that it takes about two, 3,500 calories in excess to put down one extra pound of weight. Okay, so 3,500 calories equals one pound of extra weight. So if you have one piece of pie every night, which is about 700 calories, well, make, let's make it 500 calories without the ice cream on top, apple pie, one slice, seven days in that week, you have a piece of apple pie, more than you should have. So 500 calories times seven, that's 3,500 calories. That piece of apple pie, seven times in a row, in excess to what you need to have, will put on one pound of extra weight. You got the idea? So it's a mathematical formula. So that's what people then do. They say, ah, I have to eat less. I have to have smaller serving size. I have to push away from the table. You have hunger pangs. It's a miserable life. You enjoy food and people tell you, you got to eat less. Folks, I have good news for you. Eat more and you lose weight, but the right foods. Right? Yeah. Well, that was a pretty sparse response. <laughs> I'm so glad I have my brother-in-law and his wife here as a cheering squad, since you're not really quite active here. <laughs> so, but if it's, if it's the food that you don't really like to cut back on, and they say, well, I just exercise more, burn up more calories, right? I had these two ladies coming to me, and they said, uh, they were in my age category, and uh, they said, we, we come to see you because we want to lose some weight. I said, uh, you like to change your diet? No. <laughs> what do you want to do? You want to have an exercise prescription for losing weight. I know that for every mile that you walk, you burn 100 calories. So I can figure out exactly how much distance they have to cover to burn up whatever they wanted to do as a goal. So I came up with an answer and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk from the medical center to State of Brothers, that's a big store. Uh, I want you to walk from there to there, that's 1.1 miles, round trip 2.2 miles, which really means that they were burning up 220 calories, right? After three months, they come to me and say, Dr. Deal, your program does not work. <laughs> we have gained weight. Did you change your diet? No. Did you walk every day? No. <laughs> well, actually, we walk five days a week. Oh, I said, mercy kicks in here. You're fine. We count you doing it every day. Two ladies. I always like to have two people to validate, encourage each other, and to be honest, right? So I said to these two ladies, so you have been walking every day, I mean five times a week, from the medical center, and then you turn around at the uh, State of Brothers place there, and you go back, yes sir. Now, there's something wrong with my formula. And I said, let me see this again. Now, the medical center, the Loma Linda Medical Center, you're right there, you're, you're starting there, and then you go to the State of Brothers, the big shopping center there, and what do you do there? Oh, we go inside. <laughs> what do you do there? Sir, we have been so good. We walked all this distance for a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> It was painful. I had to tell them, I'm so sorry, but that Krispy Kreme donut is 420 calories. You burn 220 calories 
and then you gained an extra 200 calories because of that crispy cream donut. Is it really worth it? And one lady says, oh yes, doctor, it really is. <laughs> So you have to walk four miles for a Krispy Kreme, you have to walk seven hours for a Super Coke with fries and a Big Mac. Exercise is not a workable solution for people that want to lose weight. Exercise is something that we do for other reasons, every day, in the gym and walking and what you did here today. But it's not a very good strategy for losing weight. That's sort of a little extra benefit, but don't try to lose weight by exercising. When you see the big losers on television, these guys are exercising 10, 12 hours a day. I mean, you have to take vacation time, you have to take um, you know, time off work uh, to, to work in this fashion. It's not the way to go. Contrary to popular belief, exercise does not provide a st good strategy for you to shape your body in terms of weight loss. So, then we're stuck. Eat more, but what? Whole foods. And when it comes to whole foods, you can eat all you want. You cannot gain weight because food as it comes in nature, whole food, foods as grown, they're high in roughage, they're high in fiber, and they're usually low in calories, so you can eat all you want, and before you can have too many calories, you're already full. And when you're full, there's a special impulse that is being sent from the stomach to the apostat that says, I am full and you're full and you're shut down, your appetite is gone. It's a wonderful mechanism. The answer that has to be found in eating foods that have high fiber content, that have high roughage, that have high nutritional value, but they're low in the concentration of calories. So, the prescription then is eat more whole foods, and exercise more, not to lose weight, but because that's the right thing to do. Before I give you those five guidelines, this is a very important uh, PowerPoint slide here. This looks at uh, a poor Mexican farmer. Um, uh, what, what do these uh, Mexican farmers eat? Uh, help me out. Uh, they eat what? Corn. What else? Co and corn is starch, isn't it? Yeah. So corn is starch. What else do they eat? Beans. Beans. Beans, that's starch, right? Potatoes, that's starch. Uh, rice, that's starch. Beans, what well, we all talked about that. So basically, and then they have an occasional community feast where they you know, have a special uh, porky dinner or something like this. But you see, basically, these people live on a diet, the green color, that's very, very high in starch. You mean you recommend eating starch? Absolutely. Listen carefully. Unrefined starch. It's not the white flour stuff that you have in pizza and pastries and cakes. No. This is starch as it comes naturally in nature. and It's always protected by the fiber that comes with it. I'll come back to that in just a minute. So the farmer now begins to realize, I'm stuck here, uh, I need to change careers, I need to help my family to have a future. And so he says to his family, I'm moving to Mexico City, I'm going to get retrained, I'm going to become a programmer, and I'm sending the money home for the next two or three years, and then the kids can go to college and we have a future. So he goes to Mexico City, what do you think happens next? He used to eat at home, now he eats out. He used to eat slow food, now he eats fast food. He used to eat beans, now he eats burgers. Fast food. Everybody does it. He's part of the new culture. And before you know it, you see, when you come to these refined foods and animal products, they always are high in fat. And so the fat consumption of that Mexican farmer, as he moves to the urban center, becomes this kind of a diet, high in fat, high in sugar, high in protein, because now you eat more animal products, so the protein that you used to get from plants,
from beans, for instance, or from corn, because protein is almost everywhere, now there's excess protein coming in from the meat. So now it's a high protein diet, which is very hard on your kidneys, which is associated with gout and all kinds of problems, particularly promoting cancers. And the starch that you eat now is basically refined flour products. Do you see? This is the American diet. This is what we do. 35% fat, about 15-20% of the calories are sugar, no nutritional value, very little nutritional value here. Starch, white flour, very little nutritional value. And then you have protein, well, there's something there, folks. You see what I'm talking about? As an epidemiologist that studies the epidemics of these diseases and asks the questions, why is it that they didn't have heart disease after the war in Japan? They couldn't find heart disease in Japan, period. And but in America, every second person died from heart disease. Why? What's the difference? Genes? Maybe, maybe not. This is the American diet composition. Whenever you find a society where the American diet invades a virgin culture, they used to eat like this. The chronic diseases begin to emerge and bloom within five to 10 years. There's a direct relationship between diet and chronic disease. So here are the five principles that you might want to write down or you might want to read them up later on in your booklet. Number one, if you want to lose weight, try to reduce empty calories. Empty calories refers to calories that have no nutritional value, right? And here we, of course, list sugar. About 16 to 20% of our calories comes from sugar, no nutritional value. Where do we find the sugar? Most people consume about 30 teaspoons of sugar a day, and it's mostly found in soda pop. But please also be aware that fruit juice is also very high in sugar. And you say, well, but I use the ones that don't have any sugar added. Well, this is natural sugar. When you take orange juice, the sugar is in the orange. But what you have done, you have concentrated the sugar content because you have squeezed it out. The fiber is gone, and now you can just gulp it down. So when you have a glass of orange juice, that's the same of three or four oranges. You'll be much better off eating the oranges. Chances are you couldn't consume three or four oranges in one time, but you can easily gulp this down. So you can easily concentrate the calories that, that comes from sugar in these fruits. So keep that in mind. What do you see there? I always tell my chip classes, I say to them, take a look at the donut. It's nice and round. <laughs> soft, it's curvaceous, it's appealing, but really study it analytically, very carefully, look at it carefully, and then always try to select the center of the donut and you will not have to worry about calories. <laughs> and then people say, wow, but they sell donut holes now too, right? See, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. One slice of German chocolate cake, 15 teaspoons of sugar. Banana split, 25 teaspoons of sugar. And this is what we give our grandchildren and our children. This is not a cereal. This is a candy. I remember doing a lecture in Battle Creek, Michigan. I was younger and quite naive because I should have recognized when you speak in Battle Creek, you don't talk about <laughs> Kellogg products. So I have 300 people in the auditorium and I talk about these, this is candy, this is not cereal, this is 52% sugar. And a person rises in the last row. I look more closely, dignified, well-dressed, silvery hair 
know I'm in trouble. <laughs> and he says, sir, I would like to correct you. I am the vice president of marketing for the Kellogg Corporation. <laughs> this is not true. It is not 52% sugar, it's only 48% sugar. <laughs> you got the idea? Yeah. And tragically, these are the kind of foods that are often purchased by people that have limited income. These are the kind of things that we buy with food stamps. I mean, look at this, the difference here is about six, seven, eight times, the price difference is eight times more for this pound of grain versus this pound of grain here. You know, you can have some oats, they're inexpensive. You can go to any store and you look for Bob's Red Mill grains, right? You've seen these things. We always recommend to our people to have breakfast with seven grams of cereal in the morning. And one man came to me after several weeks and he said, Sir, I'm getting tired of this seven grain cereal. Is there anything else we can eat? I said, Yeah, we have 10 grain cereal. <laughs> he said, No, I don't want any more grains. I have something else. I said, Well, you know, he was a single man and uh, he said, uh, I want something else. I want something different. I said, Okay, you can have millet. He looked at me, millet? And somebody pipes up, oh, those bird seeds. Oh, he said, you can eat those? I said, they're wonderful. Millet, enjoy them. He comes back a week later. He said, sir, I lost two pounds. He was lean, he wasn't supposed to lose any weight. I said, what did you do? I ate those damn millets. He was angry. I said, do you know how much it takes to chew these millet, these, these, these bird seeds? You know, I, I chew on them for hours. And I said, did you cook them? You didn't tell me. <laughs> Since then, I've become much more detail-oriented. <laughs> because most of our society today is moving towards an illiteracy in food preparation because we become spoiled, we have become spoiled by eating out. Foods are being dropped off at our front door steps. You can buy these things. And basically, we are losing the ability of being creative. And it shouldn't be that hard. Uh, we have a cookbook called um, The Optimal Diet Cookbook, and we make sure that the recipes don't take more than 15 or 20 minutes to prepare. Simple foods, three, four items per meal, and that's it. And some fruit uh, as a dessert, that's it, very simple. Not that hard, especially when you have a crock pot and you have some of these, uh, you have a microwave oven, some of these kind of things. It's easy to do. So, sugar. Then you have fats and oils. And, uh, you know, here, this is a little touchy now because most people have this idea well, olive oil is a good fat. Folks, there is no good fat, period. Because it doesn't matter whether it's good as you think of it or whether it's bad as you think of it. Every gram of fat, regardless of where it comes from, has nine calories. And every gram of starch has four calories. So if you want to lose weight, eat more starch and don't eat calories from fat. Beef fat, is it good or bad? That's saturated fat, isn't it? That's nine calories per gram. Corn oil, one gram is how many calories? Nine calories. Olive oil, one gram is? Oh. So if you want to lose weight, there's no good fat that I can recommend because every gram of fat has nine calories. Now, there's truth, some of these fats are not as desirable as others. Let me give you another idea here. What drives the cholesterol in the bloodstream what drives the heart disease in America is the amount of cholesterol in the bloodstream, which is largely driven by the liver that is directed by the amount of saturated fat that you eat. People have the idea, well, my liver produces cholesterol, there's nothing I can do about it. You can. The liver responds directly to the amount of trans fats and saturated fats that you have in your diet. Where do you find the trans fats? 15% of the fatty, the, 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 uh, fatty acids, 15% of that 
is saturated fat in olive oil, 15%. Beef fat, 50% is saturated fat. Palm oil, 78% is saturated fat. Coconut oil, 92.5%. People come to me always, sir, you must have made a mistake. I mean, I just bought five gallons at Costco of coconut oil. It's very natural. I mean, it's, uh, coconuts must be okay. I said, coconuts are okay. Coconut oil is not. It's 92% saturation. The Heart Association came out three months ago and said, um, we recommend to people to use coconut oil on their skin and on their scalp, but never inside of their bodies because it's the most saturated fat that you can ever put into your body to drive the liver to make excess amount of cholesterol, which pushes heart disease and stroke and everything else. But you wouldn't know that, would you? From the advertisement. Oh, it helps Alzheimer's. Folks, there are no studies like this. This is marketing. Of coconut oil is very easy to produce, it's very cheap, it comes from the um, Malay countries there, Indonesia and so on, and they have a lot of profit margin, so they can put a lot of money into marketing, and they market it to death, and it's another fat that is coming up. First it was the gluten, everybody thought we, have, we are gluten sensitive, it's only about 3 to 4 percent of the population, but we think it's 97 percent, now it's the coconut oil, coconut, that's the answer. Folks, don't fall for it. So fats and oils represent 20% of what we eat. Please note what happened. It takes 15, 14, 15 years of corn to produce one tablespoon of corn oil. Could you eat 14 years of corn in one session? Could you take one tablespoon of corn oil in your potato salad? No sweat. Do you see what happens? When you have extracted the oil from the original product, it's so much easier to concentrate the calories, the fat, in such a way that it becomes a calorie-rich food. For instance, you have corn chips. I mean, this is just a small little bag, nine ounces. I mean, this is almost 1,500 calories. That's half a pound of fat on your body. I mean, look at this. And then you have 5,000 plus milligrams of salt, and you shouldn't have more than 4,000 milligrams a day. So this is just one little item that gives you more salt than you should have for the whole day. So Americans have about 10 times more salt than the body needs. And salt contributes to overweight because salt is so toxic to the body that the body begins to hold on to extra water to dilute the salt. And so you might be holding 5, 10, 15 pounds of water in your tissues because of the salt-rich diet that we have here in America, especially coming from restaurant foods and processed foods. And then, please note, this is just a small bag of uh, potato chips, or in this case it's corn chips, 90 grams of fat. And we recommend, as most scientists do, that we should probably cut it back down to 35 to 45 grams for the whole day. This is one small bag hijacking you. Are you with me? Industrialized foods, and people have no idea. <clears throat> Take a look here. One tube of Pringles, I ask my medical students, how many calories do you have in a tube of Pringles? And they say, we don't know, sir, because we don't take nutrition in medical school. True, I know. So that's why you're in this class. So one tube of Pringles is a thousand calories, and I ask them, how long will it take you to eat those thousand calories? Oh, they said, we just inhaled them, they're gone. Well, they agree finally. It takes us about 13 minutes on the average to consume 1,000 calories in the form of Pringles. And they said, okay, so you run out of Pringles and now you have to eat real potatoes, right? I said, how many potatoes do you have to eat to get 1,000 calories? They said, sir, we don't know. I said, how about 10 medium-sized potatoes? They said, I have to eat 10 potatoes to get 1,000 calories? Yes. And they said, I thought potatoes are fattening. I said, no. It's 10 potatoes. This is fattening because of all the fat. Because this is 63% fat here. The potato only has 3% fat. 
This is a low calorie food. This is 100 calories. Of course, you know, if you have a mess, hash, what do you call this hash? Hash browns. Well, that's fat, big time. Lots of calories. And when you have uh, your big potato and you open it up and you bury all kinds of, what do you put in there? Cheese, butter, sour cream. Of course, it turns into a caloric bomb. And you might have 500 calories, but the original potato has, only has about 100 calories. And you say, well, I don't like to have potatoes just plain. Well, you don't have to. You can put yesterday's lentil soup on top. Lentil soup is always better on the next day. Isn't that right? So we just have to think differently, right? Okay. Well, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> so, I, I spoke at a, at a, at a, at a, to, to a group of young university students, and I said, so you had your eyes on that girl. She was it. So you take her out. You don't want to be cheap. So you get the biggest, what do you call this? Milkshake. Because after all, I take care of you. And she has no idea what you're doing to her. This is 2,000 calories. I mean, she only needs 1,500 calories for the whole day. You are fattening her for the kill. I mean, this is, this is unconscionable. What are you doing? We're not aware. That's what our culture does to us, isn't it? So you have sugars and fats and oils, no nutritional value, and alcohol, no nutritional value, so that most Americans are overfed and undernourished. Overfeeding is the number one cause of malnutrition now in America. Think about that. Industrialized food. Here's Dr. Walter Willard. He said, uh, the transition from food to becoming industrialized products has become a foundational problem, especially in the area of weight management. So principle number one, cut back on empty calories such as sugars, fats and oils, and be a little careful with alcohol, right? <clears throat> so number two, reduce animal products. Now just for being uh, transparent uh, with you, uh, I used to be a card-carrying carnivore. But I've become a victorious vegan 40 years ago, and uh, I have lived that way with my wife for the last 47 years. I'm not suggesting to reduce animal products because I'm a vegetarian and because I perhaps don't like to make uh, my stomach the graveyard of creatures out there. I do not like to put my fork into a corpse after I prayed for a blessing on the food. No. I mean, I'm sometimes astounded how pastors and priests, people of the cloth, when they have potlucks in their churches, actually I thought, bless the abundance of the food that we have here today again. That should be a prayer of forgiveness and uh, for mercy, because we know scientifically what these foods do to the people. I talked to a group of ministers and I said, you know, your, your parishioners, some of them are falling asleep in your church sermon? He said, yeah. Hey, he said, it's not you, it's the food. He said, I'm so glad to hear that. I thought it was my sermon. I said, it could be too. But you see, we have to think differently about these things. So reduce animal products, why? Again, you see a dramatic shift that has taken place from plant foods to animal products in the last 100 years. We have doubled our intake of animal products. Uh, can you imagine that the average meat eater in Winter Haven uh, in a lifetime consumes 12 cows? 12 cows? From snout to tail? 
the whole thing, 12 cows, plus 25 pigs, plus 2,400 chickens. Most of them have never seen the sun. They've never been out there. They've never been outside. They've never felt scratching the ground. They live for four or five months, and then they gain weight so quickly and so fast that their femurs, their, their leg bones begin to break under the load because the food is being pushed so heavily onto these creatures so that we can have a quick profit quality situation on our hands. Folks, it's ethically questionable. Don't you think? We kill one million animals in this country every hour. And somebody said, if you would go to these abattoirs, to these slaughterhouses, and if these slaughterhouses would only have glass walls, you would never eat another piece of cadaver. I'm not so much an animal rights person as I am concerned about health, but I'm becoming much more and more sensitized towards the other aspects too. Ethics, justice, ecology, climate change. Animal husbandry is the number one cause of climate change in America. More than all the emissions from vehicles. Far outstripping it. And then please note, when it comes to animal foods, you have a sirloin steak that's 75% fat. What? I thought it was a high protein food. This is 75% fat. When you have processed meats, like you have a hot dog, that's 85% fat. And that's 50% of things that you don't want to know. As a matter of fact, processed red meat was now declared by the World Health Organization as being directly associated with colon cancer. They don't say it's associated, they actually say it's causing cancer. They have mathematical formulas. The more processed red meat you eat, they can predict the likelihood that you will develop colon cancer and rectal cancer. So there are a lot of health issues associated with that. And red meat and white meat is not safe either. There are a lot of issues there. And then you look at cheese. You know, you know, first let's, let's take a look at cream cheese. Cream cheese, 90% of cream cheese is fat. 90%. You might as well eat Vaseline, that's 100%. <laughs> you say, well, I can't really imagine Vaseline on my bagel. Yeah, I understand. Cultural habits, cultural icons, cheese. One of the most addictive foods that you can possibly ever put on your table. About 70% of the calories of cheese is fat. And cheese today is a number one source of saturated fat in the American diet. It's a one, number one dryer, driver of atherosclerosis related diseases. It's a number one cause of circulation related diseases. It's a number one cause of heart disease, of strokes, eye problems, hearing problems, erectile dysfunction. All of these things fit into these kind of categories. Cheese is very, very addictive. Read the book, The Cheese Trap, by Dr. Barnard. It's an eye-opener. It's difficult to let go. Cheese is food porn. It promises more than it delivers. And here you see what happened to the, uh, to the cheese consumption patterns. 1970, something happened. All of a sudden, boom. What happened in 1970? What happened in 1970? Fast food, cheeseburgers, and everything else. 
Something else happened. In the 1970s, the American public rose up and they said to the dairy industry, we don't want to have whole milk because whole milk has a significant amount of saturated fat, which causes the liver to produce excessive amount of cholesterol. It's associated with heart disease. We want to have 2%, we want to have 1% milk rather than whole milk. And so that's what the industry said. No problem, we give you blue water. What do you think they did with all the, 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 uh, the, the fat? Isn't it China? No. They give us cheese. And here's the executive at home. He tells his wife, I told you, no more whole milk. She does very well, and then she forgets. And she brings home some whole milk by mistake. And he is upset with her. I told you, I don't want to have this. No, you're giving me half and half. Isn't that true? When you've gotten used to skim milk? and you have whole milk, it almost tastes like whole milk, like, like half and half. And he said, no, you're giving me half and half. I don't want this. Do you hear me? No, give me a cheeseburger. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what we do? That's why in our CHIP program, we offer people 40 hours of education because you have to have a thorough education. Please note, most of the fat that we eat comes in dairy products, meat, poultry, and fish, but also in salad oils and shortening. This is the American diet. Do you see the uh, fruits? Do you see the vegetables? Do you see the whole grains? Do you see the beans? This is the American diet. Where 50% of the calories comes from processed food, 35% comes from animal products, and only 14% of what we eat today comes from nature's products foods as grown. Only 14% comes from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and maybe some nuts and avocados and seeds. Only 14%. Well, let me take you to Loma Linda, a well-known center for uh, research on the Adventist population. Um, you have heard of the Blue Zones, of course, right? This is where you have the longest living populations around the world. There's five, six, seven areas. Uh, Loma Linda is the area where you have the longest living population in America. Okay. My neighbor just passed away. He was 104 years of age. He was still doing surgery when he was 95. You see his report in the National Geographic. Famous surgeon. This is the Adventist Health Study. It's not just related to a geographic area like Loma Linda. Anywhere in the world, when you study Adventists, you find that Adventists outlive any native population by about five to 15 years. Why is that? Because they don't use alcohol and they don't smoke. These are two factors. Number three, they're usually very consistent church goers, so they have a good social supportive network. But there's something else about these Adventists. Please note. These Adventists, they have a different kind of a diet. Um, let me see, yeah. Here you see half of the Adventists, this is now looking at 100,000 Adventists in North America. Half of these Adventists are carnivores, uh, but the other 50% are vegetarians. Some of them are fish-eating vegetarians. Some of them are uh, eggs and dairy-eating vegetarians. And then about 10% or so, they're pure vegetarians, they're vegans. Folks, I don't like the V word. So I'll refer to it as the green color, <laughs> okay? All right, so here's what they found. After seven years of following these 100,000 people, they found that Adventist women that are meat eaters on the average weigh about 40 pounds more than the people in the green category. For men, the situation is very similar. The difference between meat eating Adventist men and those in the green color is about 30 pounds. So if you wanna lose some weight, what's the suggestion here? Move towards what color? Color green, more plants, right? So, and when you move towards that color, you also have less diabetes. You only have one-fourth the amount of diabetes that the Adventists have that are meat eaters. Four. So principle number three, eat more whole foods. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because people always say to me, well, if I cut back on my refined processed foods, and if I don't eat animal, animal products, or I cut back on those, is there anything left to eat? Yes, there is. No surprise, there is. 
Please note, their fruits and their whole grains and their legumes and their vegetables, there are some nuts. Please, they're all very, very low in calories except for the nuts. They're high in fat, and you always want to restrict the amount of nuts that you eat. They're good, nutritious packages. You always want to be sort of keeping them at about one ounce or less, especially if you're going to lose weight. Okay? Avocados, they're just like butter, wonderful, nice to use for garnish, to slice, no problem. If you want to gain weight, eat a little bit more of those and you're fine. Uh, if you want to lose weight, use it in smaller amounts. Just be, you know, judicious. These are the kind of foods that we recommend. These are the kind of foods that we recommend. I want to sort of help you to understand the concept as I'm moving towards the last 15 minutes now. It has to do with caloric density. You're packing too many calories into a small space. Pringles, 63% fat. You put a lot of calories into a small amount of space, volume. Potatoes, they take up a lot of space, very low in calories because there's low uh, caloric density. Take a slice of apple pie, uh, that's 480 calories without the a la mode. You could have eaten five baked apples. You want to eat more to lose weight? There's the answer. You go to a medical convention and they have a happy hour there and you have some of these um, drinks and a few nuts. That's 740 calories. Uh, you could have eaten five pounds of fresh fruit plus two bread rolls to boot. You want to eat more? That's the answer. Well, I like to claim it as my grandson. He says, look, and he even understands this. Wow, you mean I can eat all of this food and still lose weight? Absolutely right. What about the cheeseburger? Well, it's a thousand calories. You could have had a portobello burger with eggplant. That's 250 calories. You get the idea? You could have eaten four of those. Eat more, weigh less. Because this is the, this is the, 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 the concept. Fat is very calorically dense, and even taking just a small amount of fat, which doesn't really fill you up, just barely the bottom of the stomach here is 500 calories. You could have eaten a lot of starchy foods and filled up your stomach, like you see here, as only 500 calories again. This is calorically dense food. This is nutritionally dense food. And dilute in caloric density. Give it an idea. When you have a lot of fiber in your diet, you see those blue spicules here? They fill you up and you have some calories there, but you feel full now. And when you feel full, there are sensors here on the inside wall of the stomach. And these sensors, when they're being activated by the pressure, the volume of the food in here, they send a message to the appetite, I'm full, stop. You have this kind of a food here where you have very little fiber. You have to eat many, many more calories before the stomach is full and before these sensors are being activated. That's probably how it works. So, if fiber is that important, how much fiber do you have in meat? In cheese? In sausages? In donuts? In chips? In ice cream? Zero. What do you have? The fiber? Plant food. Plenty of those. Huge. Rolos, pears, Ezekiel fortnight bread, whole wheat pasta, beans, peas. When you eat these kind of foods, you can easily get 30, 40, 50, 60 grams of fiber in your diet and not just a 10 gram measly American diet. When you have a low fiber diet, you always have to worry about digestive problems. I always have to worry about constipation. I mean, I go to an old folks' home, and I see some of the elderly ladies there, and they, one of them had a sort of a calendar there on the wall, and it had a red mark there, sort of uh, during the seven days. And I said, what's this all about? It's a special day? Oh, yeah. A special day. At BM. <laughs> you know, this is something to celebrate. You know, these people are on a low, low fiber diet, soft foods, maybe they don't chew well anymore, and so they have these. So wow. And she said, and it's very laboring. 
hypertensive. <laughs> to, as usually, read my readers' digest from cover to cover until it's all done. He said, can I make a few suggestions? More fiber-rich foods, drink seven, eight, a glass of water, and you go in and you are out and you have seven marks on your calendar. I can check it out in four weeks. Sometimes the answers are so simple that we overlook them. But let me just talk to you a little bit about sodium. We alluded to that already. That sodium uh, causes the body to hold on to some extra weight in terms of liquids. Um, the government and the scientific committee recommends about 4,000 or less milligrams of sodium a day. Americans take 10 times the amount. So obesity is in part related to sodium intake, so we have to mention it. So you can take a corn of a pulp of corn, or you can take corn flakes, and the corn flakes have 260 times more sodium. Food refinement, food processing. You can take a tomato, which is very low in sodium, or you can have tomato paste, which has 50 times more salt. You can take beans. Beans are very low in salt. But then you have uh, a can of beans. It's a salt mine. The difference is enormous. Buy your dry beans and put them in a crock pot overnight. And the next morning you have it. It's cheap. It's effective. It's low sodium. You can add some sodium and some herbs to it later on. If you buy beans in cans, make sure it says no salt added. So, as we're beginning to move towards closure, the principle, the main cause of overweight is not eating too much. It's not overeating. But it's the reliance on heavily marketed foods with a little fiber, but with plenty of calories, processed foods and animal products. And then you don't get enough exercise, get enough hours of sleep, you watch too much television, when you do this, it, you know, I mean, think about this. We do this here in this country. The, 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 there are ads on television, aren't there? I mean, sometimes I wonder if there's a film, because it seems to be just the film sort of added into uh, the uh, ads a little bit, right? And you know, I think about this. You have an ad coming in every three, four, five minutes, and when the ad comes on, the volume always, always goes up. It does. They know exactly what they're doing. And when it happens, you know what happens? They all know what to do. Millions of feet begin to move to the kitchens, to the refrigerators, and out comes softy, nice type things. And then you can sit back in your seat, in your couch, until the next commercial comes on, until yeah, and that's what we do. The commercial is the pause that reflashes. <laughs> <laughs> so again, be aware of the environment. <clears throat> the main conflict in our way then is not food volume, but it's caloric density. This is what we then recommend when this is the American standard American diet, S. A, D, the SAT program, lots of meats, dairy, eggs, processed foods, alcohol, caffeine. This is sort of the typical American diet. You have the worst outcome in terms of health. That's when you have the typical epidemic of chronic disease. On the other hand, if you move in this direction and you begin to focus more on fruits and vegetables and whole grains and uh, legumes, and then you have maybe some nuts and seeds, you have plenty of water to combine with a good excess program, and you get enough sleep, and you also become a nicer person. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Remove that stress. Become more companionable. Become more understanding. What we recommend to people, go from here to there. You set the speed. We do not say you have to be vegans. That's a good idea. 
It's the ideal way to go. But if the population is not ready, help them to understand, get on track and moving from here to there. But if you've had a heart attack, you better go from here to there. If you have a diagnosis of diabetes, you go from here to there. If your physician says, we need to do some gastric bypass because of your weight of 350 pounds, be sure that we need to do something from here to there at once. Are you with me there? Okay. Be kind in how you make those recommendations to the ones you really care about. We are not the food police. We are always, as vegetarians, the kindest and the most loving people that you can ever meet. I heard no amen. <laughs> can we improve on that? I don't mean on the amen. Can we improve on being gentle and kind? The only, the only language your loved ones will understand is your example. Your example. Principle.